Your players are about to wander away from the prepared area. It's the big fear for new DMs when you're just starting out, and it's a common question that comes up again and again. How do we stop our players from going wandering? After all, it's a role-playing game. It's supposed to give them the opportunity to do whatever they want, and maybe they will want to head away from the plot points and check out what's on the other side of the hill. But what if you haven't put anything on the other side of the hill? So welcome to this latest episode of the Red Quill's Guide to World Design. Today we're talking about the generative ideas that you can use when creating your world to alleviate some of that exploration anxiety. When your players go a-wandering, you can have something prepared and take it in your stride. Last week, we talked about creating a D&D map, and this week we're going to do something similar. As usual on the Red Quills, I'm going to demonstrate my personal preference for prepping some ambient world building a map. And I'll tie in the concepts that we're talking about to show you how you can do it too. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit more about the first time DM jitters. There's a lot of different advice floating around for first time dungeon and game masters. And it generally falls into one of two categories, either prepare everything or prepare nothing. And that's based on how experienced DMs have figured out they work. I'm sure that you will come up with a method that works for you in the long term, but for now, we're going to give you some tools to help you determine your style. When you're starting out, the trick is broad strokes with the appearance of detail. Let me explain. When creating a fantasy world, it's essential to focus on the broad strokes that convey the appearance of detail without requiring exhaustive preparation. This approach will allow you to establish overarching themes and rules that can be applied to smaller scales and enable confident improvisation while maintaining consistency. Thematic rules are fundamental principles that govern your world, such as the presence of magic, societal norms, and technological levels. These rules provide a framework to ensure coherence across different scenarios. So let's take a look at some world themes. When you create your world, The first thing to remember is that it's not just your world, it's your player's world as well. Creating a fun, immersive and explorable world is about inviting additions and improvisations to it. And that can be a bit daunting for a first time DM, especially one that has heard some horror stories about nightmare players, but that's why it's important to establish expectations early on, and you can go a long way by establishing your theme. Themes within fantasy worlds always tend to be explored or inspired by whatever genre of film or book that you like to read, and they're always fairly poorly named. I mean, what's the difference between high fantasy and low fantasy? Are are fantasy and sci-fi really genres in their own right, or are they just settings? I mean, who, who cares? The important questions are these. How defined is good and evil? The conflict between the two is a staple in fantasy, and how easy it is to tell the difference is honestly the major factor, dividing realism and fantasy proper. Is the world more defined by its past or its future? Which is really a question about history or innovation. This is the divide between a world dotted with ruins and secrets from the past, or a steampunk setting. Are most people basically selfish or selfless? And I'm sure that everyone has a different take on this, but it's your world. It's important to remember that when you make up characters on the fly, no matter how self-aware you are, your biases will creep in. It's important to know what these are ahead of time. You have the opportunity to explore other things as well, but these three questions will help you to define a world that exists even when your characters aren't around. And that's the difference between a boring world and a boundless world. So, You have some basic rules, now we can make a map. Literally, in this case, but it can be metaphorically. You have these rules and they can help you as you map things out. Ruins or factories, the lands of evil overlords or good defenders. If the players venture into an unknown town, you can quickly apply cultural norms and technological levels to create a believable setting. Involve players in world building by allowing them to add details within the established thematic rules, such as describing their character's hometown, and by establishing broad thematic rules, you can create a consistent and immersive world and confidently handle player exploration and generate engaging settings on the fly. 
Now that you've got the broad strokes and the themes in place, it's time to dive into the nitty gritty, making the rules that will govern your world. These rules are the backbone of your setting, ensuring that everything feels cohesive and believable no matter where your players wander. Rules are essential for maintaining consistency and immersion. Think of them as the underlying physics of your world. When you have clear rules, you can confidently improvise details, knowing that they'll fit seamlessly into the larger picture. So let's break down the type of rules that you'll want to consider. Define how magic works in your world. Is it rare or common? Are there different schools or types of magic? What are the costs and the limitations? In a world where magic is rare, only a select few individuals might wield it, making them revered or feared. Magic items are valuable and scarce, and casting spells could have significant consequences. Decide on the technological advancement of your world. Are they in a medieval era with swords and castles, or is it a steampunk setting with steam-powered machinery? In a medieval setting, transportation relies on horses and carriages, and communication is done through messengers or magics. Weapons are swords, bows and crossbows, no firearms or advanced machinery. Always think about the implications and consequences of innovation within your world. If gunpowder exists, then someone might try to create guns or fireworks or even engines. If zeppelins exist, then you're beginning to think about buoyancy and the different implications that that can have as well. Steam engines create trains and ships and other innovations that will allow factories to become larger. Lastly, establish the cultural and societal norms. What are the major religions, traditions and social structures? How do people view honor, loyalty and other virtues? In a society where honor is paramount, breaking an oath might result in severe punishment or social ostracism, while loyalty is highly rewarded and celebrated. And this is also the opportunity to consider the other concepts that you want to explore in your world. Racism, classism, capitalism, etc. Remember though, that it's not the DM's role to lecture about your opinions. The fun part of playing these concepts is in the exploration you just provide the questions, not the answers. By creating clear, consistent rules for your world, you can lay a strong foundation that makes improvisation easier and ensures that your setting feels immersive and coherent. These rules help you to maintain the appearance of detail and depth, even when you're making things up on the fly. So let's take some time to define the world's magic, the technology, and the societal norms, and you'll be well prepared for whatever adventures the players throw your way. I think it's finally time for me to acknowledge the map that I'm creating here. What I'm doing is I'm creating a map of the duchies of the Kingdom of Endon for a similar quest to what we've been exploring so far. Within the world, I ran a civil war campaign. The different barons and counts and dukes fought for one another, vying for the power of the throne, which requires not only a fairly complicated beginning so that you know who the major factions are and how they interact, but as your players interact with the varying sides as they change things or alter outcomes, you can come up with new sides, new developments, different ways for the war to go so that they can truly feel as if they have altered the outcome. As I go through this map, it is basically the same as a normal kingdom map, but I'm adding in a great deal more political detail. When I create these symbols for the castles or the different fortifications and the areas and the regions of the kingdom, they will be illustrated with the different sides that they're on, their own personal histories and more that I can use to extrapolate how they would react to one another and to unexpected consequences. By the way, this is a great opportunity for me to remind you that if you're watching this video, if you find it helpful, you can subscribe to the Red Quills YouTube channel. We also, if you wanted to support our channel and what we do, have YouTube and Patreon memberships so that you can access our exclusive Q&A sessions, vote on upcoming topics, and more. There's details on both of them on our page. You can check them out. But let's head back into it. Now that we've established the broad strokes and the rules that govern your world, it's time to delve deeper. We're going to break your world down into three layers, the cosmos, 
the realm, and the locality. Each layer adds a different level of detail and helps you to create a world that feels expansive and alive, even if you're making it up as you go along. And these layers, by the way, aren't literal. They're just the strands that we can use to connect one another. The cosmos is the grand overarching layer of your world. It's where you define the gods, the history of the world, the theme of your campaign. It can apply to any point within your entire world. Think of it as the backdrop against which all of your stories play out. Who are the gods of your world? What are their domains? How do they interact with mortals? Are they distant, unknowable beings? Or do they walk among the people? You can outline major events that have shaped your world. Wars, cataclysms, rise and fall of empires. These are the stories that have left their mark on the land. And decide what the central theme of your campaign is. Is it a tale of good versus evil, a struggle for survival in a harsh world? It'll help you guide your storytelling and provide a consistent tone for your adventures. You can create these using timelines or pantheons or exploring the themes that we talked about before. It's all about you understanding what the implications of your vision are. Don't be afraid to sketch them into the borders of your map so you have an easy reference point that you can pull out and take a look at. The realm is the middle layer of detail. Here you focus on the kingdoms, the empires, the major conflicts of the mortal world. This is where the politics, the wars, and the ebb and flow of power come into play. Who are the political rulers? What are their ambitions? What are the major factions? How do they interact? Detail major conflicts that are currently shaping the world. These can provide ready-made plot hooks, add senses of urgency to your adventures. How does magic influence society? Are there powerful mage guilds or is magic tightly controlled by the ruling elite? This layer is most relevant to the map that I'm creating now, although there are locality and cosmos rules as well. I'm adding in details in the notes beside each political capital so that I can reference very quickly what their intentions are and what their expectations are. You can do the same in your own maps. The locality is the most immediate layer of detail. This is where you zoom in on the everyday lives of the people in your world. It's where your players will spend the most amount of their time and it's important to make it feel rich and vibrant. But on the flip side, it can be the hardest to illustrate. The cosmos layer applies to every location in the world. The realm layer only applies to the realm itself, to the kingdom or the nation or the empire. The locality is the most specific. It only applies really to a, a small layer. But the beauty of it is that if you establish rules rather than facts, then you can apply those rules across the board whereas you can only apply the facts to a very small area. So flesh out any towns and villages and cities where your players will adventure. You can create interesting NPCs with their own goals and personalities. What are everyday problems they face, bandit raids, crop failures, local feuds? These small-scale issues can be engaging as grand world-spanning conflicts. Add flavor to the world of cultural details, festivals, traditions, local cuisine, the little touches that make it feel lived in. But the most important thing to ask yourself is have you considered these as rules? What are the rules for what a villager will expect? What's their life like across the world? When you're rocking up to a village, ask yourself very quickly, if you don't have anything prepared, what's the specific cultural nuance that they have? What are they known for? What's, what are their local concerns? What are they nearby? What threatens them? Who's their ally? Who's their enemy? By breaking the world down into layers, you can create a setting that feels both grand and intimate, a place where epic stories can unfold and personal dramas can also play out. These layered approaches help you keep track of the big picture while providing plenty of detail for those moments when your players want to explore every nook and cranny. All right, let's talk about quests. With your world thoroughly outlined in its three layers, it's time to focus on the lifeblood of any campaign, the quests. Having a range of quest ideas ready can help you to keep the adventure moving smoothly no matter what direction your players decide to take. And in this section, we'll talk about generating quest ideas on the fly, understanding the different types of quests, and tying them into the world lore. One of the most valuable skills for a DM is the ability to come up with quest ideas on the spot. Your players are unpredictable, and sometimes they'll head off in a direction that you didn't expect. And here's how to stay prepared. Think small. 
Not every quest needs to be epic. A local farmer might need help with bandits or a merchant might hire the party to protect their caravan. If you're struggling for ideas of small things and you've only prepared a large campaign, you can give them a quest that appears to be small at the reward of which is a portion of the information that you would have given them on a major quest that allows them to follow the main plotline. Use your world rules, lean on the rules and themes that you've established. If magic is rare, maybe a quest involves finding a lost spell book. If honor is paramount, perhaps the quest revolves around restoring someone's tarnished reputation. And don't forget your players' backstories. Incorporate elements from your players' backstories. This not only makes quests more engaging, but also helps to tie the characters into the world. Quests come in many flavors, and mixing them up can keep your campaign fresh and exciting. So here are the four major types. Combat quests focus on battles and physical challenges. For example, clearing out a nest of goblins, threatening a village, or protecting a fortress from an impending attack. These are often the meat and potatoes of a role-playing game, particularly in Dungeons and Dragons, where the majority of the rules are geared towards combat. Puzzle quests require players to solve riddles or navigate complex solutions. For example, uh, deciphering an ancient map to find hidden treasure, which we'll talk about more in the next video, or figuring out how to disable a series of magical traps in a dungeon. They require your players to think. And it doesn't have to be a written puzzle or a riddle. It could simply be a matter of having to use their brains, finding a solution that's outside the box. Roleplay quests emphasize interaction with NPCs and making decisions based on dialogue. You might have them negotiating a peace treaty between warring nations or convincing reclusive wizards to help with a dire problem. And these are my favorite kinds of quests, but they can be a little intimidating for first-time DMs. Remember to have fun and play things loosey-goosey. Finally, Moral Dilemma quests challenge players with difficult choices and ethical quandaries, like deciding whether to save a town from a plague by sacrificing a few innocents, or choosing between two equally deserving parties in a dispute. I myself have used these many times. My players have been faced with choices between going along with easy but evil paths, or hard but morally good paths, all the time. To make quests feel meaningful and integrated into your world, tie them into the lore and the themes that you've established. You can reference past events or figures in your quests. Maybe the quest revolves around finding a relic from an ancient war or solving a mystery connected to a legendary hero. Involve the political landscape like I'm doing here. Quests could impact the balance of power between factions or advance the goals of a particular ruler. Use cultural details to enrich your quests. Perhaps a festival is the backdrop for a mystery or local traditions provide clues to solving a puzzle. By keeping a variety of quest themes on hand and tying them into the world's lore, you can ensure that your campaign remains dynamic and engaging. Whether your players are fighting off goblins or solving ancient puzzles, engaging in an intricate role play or facing tough moral choices, you'll be ready to guide them through an immersive adventure. Remember, the goal is to create a world where each quest feels like a natural extension of the setting. It draws the players deeper into the story with each quest that they take. Now this map is designed to help me create not only the rules for exploring this realm, but also to create quests on the fly. I've labeled each major town with a basic sentence about their history, something that I know about them, and what their intention as a community is within the context of the Civil War. This is more than enough information for me to use these rules that I've just established to create quests based entirely on locality rules so that they can explore a world that keeps generating itself over and over and over again. And with those rules and those methods in your back pocket, as well as the printout as some random names for you to give to NPCs to make up as you go, you should be ready for any off-book shenanigans from your friendly neighborhood chaos gremlins. The important part is, of course, to remember to have fun. And don't be afraid to take your time. Talk to your players about what you expect and what they expect. You're all there to have fun, but I'm not here to talk about session zero. So, we're 
come to the end of creating your D&D world building and I hope that you found this video useful. If you did, check out some of the concept videos and tutorials on our Red Quills channel. Once again, thank you to the wonderful community that we have. We're just starting our memberships and our Discord server to discuss all things maps. The link is in the description below. As always, if you have any questions, chuck them in the comments. Any likes and subscribes to help the channel are very welcome. Stay tuned for next week's video, which is all about creating some lore for your worlds. See you soon, adventurers.